Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the Book of Revelation. And this is lesson number six in that series for February 9 of 2019, entitled, The Sealed People of God. Now, last time we talked about seals on a document. Now we're talking about sealed people. What will it have to say about sealed people? people. This primarily focuses on chapter 7 in the book of Revelation. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we bow before you now, recognizing your presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit. We recognize how challenging some of these passages in Revelation are to understand. Help us now to put together the pieces in a way that is responsible and is clear according to your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you look through the book of Revelation, you will discover that there's a lot of sevens. And starting with the seven churches and the seven seals, and now we're into the, pretty soon we'll be into seven trumpets, and then eventually we're going to get to seven plagues. And we're going to find out that, except for the seven churches, between at the end of every set of seven, between number six and number seven, there's an interlude with something else different, completely different happens. So now we talked about the seven seals in our last lesson last week. Now we're going to talk about that interlude between uh, seal number six and seal number seven on in that scroll that the Lamb is opening. So what's going on in this interlude between... Um, we know that after this, mountains and islands have disappeared. There's a great question arises. Who will, I mean, just before this, who will be able to stand through those terrible events just before Jesus comes back? And the answer is given in Revelation 14, 1 to 5. We're going to look at that a couple of times. I'm going to read it first of all right now. Then I looked, and there was a lamb standing on Mount Zion. With him were 144,000 people who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven that sounded like a roaring waterfall, like a loud peal of thunder. It sounded like the music made by musicians playing their harps. I'm trying to figure out how thunder sounds like harps, but anyway. The 144,000 people stood before the throne, the four living creatures and the elders. They were singing a new song which only they could learn. They are the only ones who have been redeemed. They are the men who have kept themselves pure by not having sexual relations with women. They are virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They have been redeemed from the rest of the human race and are the first ones to be offered to God and to the Lamb. They have never been known to tell lies. They are faultless. So that's going to be our, one of our key passages for this study. And they're called the 144,000. So each of the groups of seven in the book of Revelation are focused on the final events of this earth's history. So if you look at each group of sevens, the last couple usually, so if you, if you figure out, if you've got the last couple of items out of seven are focused on the very final events of this earth's history, that means that the whole thing is primarily focusing on what's coming up at the end, right? So that's what we're going to talk about. The group of trumpets, which comes up next, found in Revelation 10, 1 to 11, 14, talks about an angel who gives John a scroll he is told to eat it, and it will be sweet in his mouth, but sour in his stomach. Now, those of you who have been Seventh-day Adventists for most of your lives, what does that make you think of? Great disappointment. The great, yeah, the great, the great disappointment. disappointment in 1844. Mm -hmm. Then he was given a measuring rod and told that he was to measure the temple of God, but that the outer courts of the temple would be given to the heathen who will trample on, on the holy city for 42 months or 1260 prophetic days or years. Now. Can you think of anything that happened in those outer courts that we know about from Scripture? The Inquisition. Well, the Non-Jewish people could come yeah, out. Yeah, the there. Gentiles could go there. Yeah. Okay, so and so and what was happening in the days of Jesus? What was happening there? The business was going on. The yeah. Were there. So original God's plan was that those large outer courts were supposed to be places where the Gentiles could come. They could observe how the Jews were worshiping. They could learn about God and so forth. And eventually they could choose to worship God as the Jews did, and they would be a part of the Jewish nation. But the Jews came to think that 
the Gentiles are lost anyway. There's no way they can be saved. They're not a part of us. So they turned those outer courts into that marketplace that Jesus cleansed on two different occasions. So we're talking about that. Then God will send two faithful witnesses, way, there we go, dressed in sackcloth to proclaim his message. These two witnesses are olive trees or lamps, and they have the power to destroy those who attack them. But surprisingly, when they finish proclaiming their message, a beast comes up out of the abyss and fights against them. So you recognize all kinds of symbolism here that should be popping things up in your mind. Where's the abyss, by the way? Who is connected to the abyss? Death, isn't it? Who? Death. Death, what else is connected with Falling the abyss? On. This is the home of the devil. Yeah. Yeah. This is the home of the devil. He defeats them and kills them. So the devil comes up out of the abyss and fights against these two witnesses. People from all nations, tribes, languages, and races look at their dead bodies and celebrate. Does that sound like these people are on God's side? No. But three and one half years later, a life-giving breath comes to them from God, and they stand up. This terrifies all who see them. That message closes with a terrible earthquake. So this just gives you an example of another thing we're going to talk a little bit about later. Sounds like a bad dream. Yeah, it does. So now John, see, uh, John sees four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding back the winds of strife until God's faithful people are sealed. That's Revelation 7, 1 to 3. Peter went on to say that God wants everyone to be sealed. Maybe we should read those verses. Give me just a second here. 2 Peter 3, starting with verse 9. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. Okay, and then, of course, he goes on to describe events connected with the second coming. So, uh, but he reminds us that we will not know exactly when the day of the Lord comes. That is, the exact day of the close of probation. It will come like a thief. Then the heavens and the earth will disappear, and we need to do our best to hasten his coming. So what are those, let's talk about some of the symbolism now. What do those winds represent? Destruction, destruction, destruction destructive war. forces, yeah. God's judgments upon the wicked. Even in Old Testament times, places like Jeremiah 23, 19 and 20, and Daniel 7, verse 2. Let me just read Jeremiah 23 there. His anger is a storm, a furious wind that will rage over the heads of the wicked, and it will not end until he has done everything he intends to do. And days to come his people will understand this clearly. That sounds like God's going to zap them, doesn't it? We've already discovered that many of the symbols that John uses here in the book of Revelation come from the Old Testament. Ellen White makes a comment. Carrie? As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passions, all the elements of strife will be let loose. That comes from the Great Controversy, page 614, paragraph 1. Okay, so what does those few words tell us? What, what is going to be God's role as we approach the end of this earth's history? He's going to let things go. He's going to back off slowly, 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 and let who have more and more power? Well, the fierce winds of human passions let okay. evil. And who's responsible for those? Satan, yeah. Satan. So now, the people are going to, Jim, did you look puzzled? I am. I'm still back there under three, where we talk about the outer courts for 42 months or 1260 prophetic days, and the two witnesses that are dead for three and a half years. Are those days too? Um, what does that mean? Well, because they stand up and come alive. Ellen so White we, describes we that. I, I don't that know why. Much. I don't know why our lesson has this section here, and I think later on he's going to talk about it more. But anyway. Um, Ellen White clear, this says that this represents the period of, of papal suppress, uh, uh, dark ages, dark ages dark age. from 538 to, to 1798. But this thing that happens right at the end is the French Revolution. Yeah. The three and a half years. The three and a half years. And there was, those are literal years. Literal. 
And Sometimes we're talking about figurative days representing mm -hmm. years. And all the people of France were rejoicing that the power of the church was gone and it was no longer there. And then the goddess of reason. Yeah, the goddess of reason, okay. all that kind of stuff. So all right, and thank the you. New, the I needed two that. witnesses, the old and the new testament. The they old and the new testaments. In the streets. And what happened almost immediately after that, a few years later, the British and Foreign Bible Society and other Bible societies sprung up and they were translating the Bible into different languages and carrying it all over the world. Missionaries were sent yeah. out. Missionaries were sent out. So it was not that's exactly the, what the devil the was looking after. for. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now what does it mean for human beings to be sealed? Okay. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually, so that they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has begun. It has begun already. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us a warning that we may know what is coming. This is from Ellen G. White, medical missionary work in Southern California. She had a very, very provocative interview regarding mission, the build-up of missionary work in Southern California, and this is a part of it. If you ever have a chance, go and look at the whole thing, mm. because Loma Linda, we are a part of that, the results of that discussion. But unfortunately, we know that the devil is not asleep. He's going about like a roaring lion, right? Um, he knows, Revelation 12, he knows that his time is short and he's very angry. And what is his response? Look at Revelation 13, 15 to 17. The second beast, now we haven't got to Revelation 12 and 13 yet, but let me just tell you the second beast is a reference to, you know, the United States of America. Yeah. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast that refers to the papacy, so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. So what is God's, what is Satan's plan? Rid the earth of Eliminate. people who Rid the God. earth of anybody who worships God. Yeah. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark. That is the beast name or the number that stands for the name. Wow. So basically, Satan has declared all out war on God's people. But we know about Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 14, 12, but we probably should look at those just very briefly. Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was furious with the woman, that would be the church, and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. So who is he angry about <coughs> or angry at? Those who keep the commandments, those who continue to be faithful to God, right? Mm -hmm. And then Revelation 14, 12, this calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who <coughs> obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Well, uh, there's a lot of other places we could look at. Clearly, these passages suggest that God's seal involves the keeping of the Seventh-day Sabbath and all that it represents. Uh, and those who are faithful to God will be preserved despite all that Satan does. He will also have a mark called the mark of the beast to identify those who are his. Okay. Revelation 7, 4 to 8 says, And I was told that the number of those who were marked with God's seal on their foreheads was 144,000. They were from the tribes of Israel, 12,000 from each tribe. Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulon, Joseph, and Benjamin. The announcement of the number of those who are sealed marks the completion of the sealing. John hears that their number is 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. The reference here is not to a literal number, but to what it signifies. The number 144,000 consists of 12 times 12 
times 1,000. Twelve is a symbol of God's people, the tribes of Israel and the church built upon the foundation of the Twelve Apostles, from Ephesians 2.20. Thus the number 144,000 stands for the totality of God's end time people, all Israel, Jews and Gentiles, who are ready for Christ's return and who will be translated without seeing death. And I'm going to take a, just a reference. I, I added a, one other reference for I thought we should look at. I thought it's particularly important. Galatians 3, 28 and 29, about who are the descendants of Abraham. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. So that should help us to understand the 12 tribes of Israel, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. How do so, you divide it up, though, like that? Well, let's, let, let's read another couple of minutes here, and I think we'll get a better idea about that. So where are these 12 tribes of Israel? Hmm. We don't have time. Well, let me just read a part, part of it. Look at 2 Kings 17, starting with verse, I'll, I'll really start with verse 5. Then Shalmaneser, invade, now he, this would be the main general from the uh, armies of Assyria, not Syria, but Assyria, invaded Israel and besieged Samaria. In the third year of the siege, imagine living in a city, a small city, surrounded by a major army for three years which was the ninth year of the reign of Hosea, the Syrian emperor captured Samaria, took the Israelites to Assyria as prisoners, and settled some of them in the city of Hala, some near the river of Habor, and there's just a Gozan, and some in the cities of Media, very far away. So what has he done with the 12 tribes? He scattered them. Scattered them. He scattered them to the winds. We have no way of tracing any of them. Samaria fell because the Israelites sinned against the Lord, God, Lord their God, who had rescued them from the king of Egypt, and had led them out of Egypt. They worshipped other gods, followed the customs of the people whom the Lord had driven out of his people as his people advanced and adopted customs introduced by the kings of Israel. And very sad story goes on there. Historically, then we know that there are no people today that you can identify as belonging to these twelve tribes these ten tribes. Just none. Not that we know of. Not that we know of. I mean, what would happen if you were able to go through the books and watch all the all the oh, people born from then to what, now? Could you yeah. figure out who was where? No. You don't think so? No, because they were scattered those places and they just integrated completely with the people who were there. So these people now would be almost 100% of them would be Arabs, Muslims, Iraqis, Iranians, Turks. Well, wouldn't their descendants be from those places, though? Well, but how many, if you, if you take them in, okay, then they, they marry an Iranian, and then th that Iranian, he, so he's you half Iranian. You can still trace the, the lineage going back. Well, There's you might, so, by, by now, by yeah. now you go. No, we could, too, if we got to heaven and we started oh, figuring out, yeah. no, you could start yeah. figuring out the, um, the history. Okay, but who are you going to trace it from? Who are you through? going to trace it from? It's spread everywhere like a big sponge. Well, you can't. If you know who's, who's been married, well, I've got a what, what uh -huh. babies have been born, and you could trace it one at a time. Oh, if you could live you the whole time, if you could live the whole time from Adam to your life right there, they could pick what tribe you came from. Well, but the, the pro there's a serious problem with that yes. that you haven't taken account of. The flood. Well, not only that, we could. We, that just means we just have to go back to Noah. But who, who, who are you going to? Whose side are you going to trace it down? You going to trace it down the male side or the female side? Whatever one you want. Well, but or both. So but what you're going to find out is that that some nations are going to trace it through the male side, and other nations are going to trace it through the female side. You're going to be completely lost. No, the no, Jews. I don't think so. I don't, the Jews no, trace it. In this life, you're lost. <laughs> in this life, you next are life. The, yeah, the next, that's next what I'm life. talking about. If you're a real genealogist. If there's angels that answer. have taken, the, taken stock of what's happened, who's okay. been married to who, okay. you could probably find out as soon as all this is over with, well, the you'll Indian, probably add them all up and yeah. say, sure enough, 
Those numbers are exactly well, right. Gary, you'll work on that up there. So. <laughs> oh, there's already <laughs> people already done. What, I will, what I will tell you is that the Jewish people today require that the lineage be traced through the mother. I don't care what the Jewish they, think today. I just want to know what God thinks and what, what okay. this thing well, means. Actually. I don't think it's a big deal with God. Yeah. Okay. Is this a literal number or is it symbolic? Um, who, who is we? Well, I guess Dennis. Oh, no, Janet, D Dennis. I'm sorry, Jim again. Also, the list of the 12 tribes in Revelation 7 is like no other found in Scripture. If you'll compare Numbers 1, 5 to 15, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 48, 1 to 29. For instance, Judah is listed as the first tribe instead of Reuben, if you look at Numbers. Also, the tribes of Dan and Ephraim included in the lists of Numbers 1 and Ezekiel 48 are omitted from the list in Revelation 7, while Levi and Joseph are included instead. The obvious reason for the exclusion of Ephraim and apparently Dan from the list in Revelation 7 is that in the Old Testament these two tribes are apostate and idolatrous. Wow. So now we got an additional problem for you, Gary. Two of those tribes, you don't know which two to put in. Well, the, I don't, the, the but I'm sure the person <laughs> who's watching could. Isn't the foundations of the New Jerusalem one for yep. every tribe? So which ones do they count? Well, probably Joseph's the ones, two. Probably the ones that are listed here. Let's well, see, when, when, e, when Ephraim gets dropped out, Joseph gets put in his place. When Dan gets dropped out, Levi gets put, put in his place. Because initially... Uh, Joseph had two places, Manasseh mm -hmm. and Ephraim. That's right, because Levi wasn't counted because they were the priests. Mm -hmm. And they didn't get a separate so chunk of land for, for their inheritance. So really be, 13. Because they were, because they're really 13. Because mm -hmm. yeah. Joseph got a double portion. Well, it should be clear then that this is not a literal number applying only to hereditary Jews. Okay, the list of the tribes. Uh, the list of the tribes in Revelation 7 is not historical but spiritual. The absence of Dan and Ephraim from the list suggests that the unfaithfulness of these two tribes will have no place among God's sealed people. Also, the church in the New Testament is referred to as the 12 tribes of Israel, James 1.1. 1, 1. The 12 tribes of Revelation 7 stand for the entire people of God who endure to the end both Jews and Gentiles. And that's what Paul suggested as we read from there, Galatians 3, 28 and 29. But John now sees another group. Who are they? Well, look at Revelation 7, 9 and 10. After this I looked and there was an enormous crowd. No one could count all the people. They were from every race, tribe, nation and language. So not just Jews. And they stood in front of the throne and of the Lamb, dressed in white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. They called out in a loud voice. Remember we said that uh, most of the time the throne room of God is a noisy place. They called out in a loud voice, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. So why did they... Why do we have these two groups? We've got the 144,000 well, and we got the big group. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about. Clearly these people who are faithful to God, the, the, clearly these people are faithful to God and they are standing in front of the throne in heaven. They are shouting and singing because they have survived a great tribulation. Is this another description of, of the 144,000? Well, that's a possibility. Or could this be another group? We know that the word tribulation is used in the Bible to describe God's faithful people who suffer because of their faith. Examples are found in Exodus 4, 31, Psalm 9, 9, Matthew 24, 9, John 16, 33, and Romans 5, 3. So what does Ellen White tell us about this group? Gary, you're going to help us there. Nearest the throne are those who were once zealous in the cause of Satan, but who, plucked as brands from the burning, have followed the Savior with deep, intense devotion. Next are those who are perfect Christians, Christian characters, in the midst of the falsehood and infidelity. Those who honor the law of God when the Christian's world declared it void, 
and the millions of all ages who were martyred for their faith. And beyond is the great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, Revelation 7, 9. Their warfare is ended, their victory won, they have run the race and reached the prize. The palm branch in their hand is a symbol of their triumph, the white robe, an emblem of their spotless righteousness of Christ, which now is theirs. Ellen G. White, The Great Controversy, 665. Now, do we have a picture here of during the thousand years? Are we thinking that this is Reasonable after belief. the second coming? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find it quite interesting that those were the most zealous in the cause of Satan are standing next to the throne then the other people on that side. I've never seen that before. Yep. Very interesting. That These are really people who used to be zealous for Satan and now they've come and they are really, you know, this is a Paul. Yeah. You know, he was on the side of Satan. And then where is he now? Man, he's the number one champion for God's cause. And the faithful Christians with the characters, they're next. Mm -hmm. And you go on out to the outer regions and you got millions of people, it's not 144,000. Exactly. So, so there were martyrs, because, some of them. As we've suggested, because John is getting a lot of ideas from the Old Testament, I'm going to ask you to look with me at Deuteronomy 8, verses 11 to 17. <coughs> Make certain. Now, this is one of Moses' last sermons to the people of Israel, they're standing on the plains of Moab, just waiting for, di for directions to cross the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And here's one of the things he says to them. Make certain that you do not forget the Lord your God. Do not fail to obey any of His laws that I'm giving you today. When you have all you want to eat and have built good houses to live in, and when your cattle and sheep, your silver and gold, and all your other possessions have increased, Make sure that you do not become proud and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from Egypt where you were slaves. You, he led you through that vast and terrifying desert where there were poisonous snakes and scorpions. And now some people, if you read just numbers, it sounds like, you know, he caused the snakes. No, they were already there. In that dry land, waterless land, he made water to flow out of solid rock for you. In the desert, he gave you manna to eat, food that your ancestors had never eaten. He sent hardships on you to test you so that at the end he could bless you with good things. So then, you must never think that you have made yourselves wealthy by your own power and strength. So, what does that, what does that say to us? Moses is reminding that God has brought them through all these difficulties. Will the people who arrive before the throne of God at the second coming, will they have been brought through a lot of difficulties? really the worst difficulties in the history of our world, right? So now, we've already looked at different places, but now let's go back to Revelation 14, 1 to 5. Jim? Then I looked, and there was a lamb standing on Mount Zion, excuse me, Mount Zion. With him were 144,000 people who have his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven that sounds like a roaring waterfall, like a loud peal of thunder. It sounded like the music made by musicians playing their harps. The 144,000 stood before the throne, the four living creatures and the elders. They were singing a new song which only they could learn. They are the only ones who have been redeemed. They are the men who have kept themselves pure by not having sexual relations with women they are virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever it goes. They have been redeemed from the rest of the human race and are the first ones to be offered to God and to the Lamb. They have never been known to tell lies. 
they are faultless. Good news Bible. Okay, so now there's several things we need to, me to, need to, to, to clarify here. What does it mean not to have sexual, sexual relations with women? Well, these people have survived to the fullest extent of Satan's wrath in the final crisis. But because of their very close relationship with Jesus Christ, God has protected them. But they have not, so they have not been defiled with the teachings of Satan or his followers. Sexual immorality is a symbol in the Bible of unfaithfulness to God. Uh, let's just look at that, Revelation 17, 5. On her forehead was written a name that has a secret meaning, Great Babylon. This is the apostate church, the prostitute church. Great Babylon, the mother of all the prostitutes and perverts in the world. So that gives us a clue about what group we're talking about. So the 144,000 are, for, did you want to comment? Well, I'm looking back up two paragraphs ahead of time there on okay. Great Controversy 665. Mm -hmm. Mentions four different groups standing close around the throne. Right. And you know, I don't see the 144,000 mentioned right there. They're not? No. Yeah, I was wondering if you uh, would, if someone uh, would pick that four up. Four different groups standing there, and they're not listed in Great Controversy. And then later we she read describes that, it. that they're the ones following Jesus around. Well, here's, here's uh, what our, Bible, our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, February 6th says. The 144,000 are further described as the ones who have been redeemed from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. In ancient Israel, the first fruits were the best fruits of the harvest offered to God. Numbers 18, 12. The word first fruits can refer to saved people as distinct from those in the world. James 1, 18. But in Revelation, the 144,000 are clearly a special group because they will be translated without seeing death. 1 Corinthians 15, 50, 15, 50 to 52. Thus they are the first fruits of the larger harvest of the saved to all ages. Now, is that a possibility? Largest, the first fruits, the larger portion of those who are first fruits of people from all ages. So uh, does that mean they go up first and when first Jesus comes? That's a good question. We don't know. They are the first fruits of the larger harvest. Yeah. The larger harvest is everybody else. Okay, well, but we've already is talked about... a literal number? No. Probably not. No, Probably it's not, like symbolic. Yeah. But uh, we've already talked about the first fruits back when we were talking about the throne room in heaven. We suggested that maybe the 24 elders that are standing around the, the throne of God, the word elder, remember, is never used for anybody except human beings in the Bible. So one possibility, I'm not, this is not a final word, but one possibility is that those elders were some of the people who were raised by with Jesus at the time of his death and resurrection, and he took them to heaven. Like so that. they maybe they are the, the very first fruits. Now this is the first fruits of the larger group. Okay? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Could be. So, but we need to stay very close to Jesus and be without fault. This is necessary because the devil will do everything possible to deceive and destroy God's faithful people. What does that make you think of? <laughs> Any verses in the Bible? Walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Okay, that's, that's one Peter. place. Look at Matthew 24. Jesus answered, be on your guard and do not let anyone deceive you. Many men claiming to speak for me will come and say, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many people. And then look at uh, 20, verses 23 and 24 in that same chapter. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform great miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people, if possible. So it's not going to be easy, right? So what does it mean to be without fault? Gary? Without fault in in, in uh, Greek. Yeah, I was trying to think of the grammatical. F the meaning of without fault comes from the Greek word amamos, blameless. Refers to the fidelity of the 144,000 to Christ. 
In the Bible, God's people are called to be holy. And then it mentions Leviticus 19, 2, 1 Peter 2, 9, and talks of Abraham, genera- uh, Genesis 17, 1, and Job, Job 1, 1, were blameless. Christians are called to be holy and without blemish before God. And then it mentions Ephesians 5, 27, Philippians 2, 15. That comes from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday, February 7. And we move on. And it's got in uh, brackets, Revelation. Seven is inserted, we're talking about the seals here. Seven is inserted parenthetically between the six. Mentions Revelation 6, 12 to 17. And seventh, Revelation 8, once. And this is the seal. Chapter six closes with the opponents of God calling on the rocks and mountains to hide them from the face of God and the wrath of the Lamb mentions Revelation 6, 15 and verse 16. They then close with the poignant statement, quote, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand, unquote. Mentions Revelation 6, 17 and comes from the New King James Version. That question is answered in chapter 7 with the appearance of two groups, the 144,000, Revelation 7, 4 to 8, and the great multitude, mentions Revelation 7 verses 9 to 14. In order to survive the calamities that accompany the second coming, it is necessary to be sealed. And Revelation 7, 1 to 3 is mentioned there. The end result is a people who stand blameless before the throne of God, throne rather, of God. Mentions Revelation 14, 5. And serve him in his temple, Revelation 7, 15. The purpose of Revelation 7 and 14 within their larger context is to identify what God's people will be like just before the second coming. Wow. Okay. So here we're talking about special groups of people that are, and in, in we've already suggested that these people will be translated without tasting death at the end of this world's history. That means they're going to stand through what final events in the history of the world? Well, the seven, la- <clears throat> the seven last plagues. The seven last plagues, the, plagues yeah. for sure. The latter rain, the deceit- deceitful time, the false latter rain by Satan, a lot of things are going to happen. So what's the difference between the groups? What, what groups them out? What makes one go into one group and one out in the other? I mean, as opposed, you, which of the two groups you're talking about? You got the big group. The big group the and 144. Okay, that's we're, we're we're still talking about that. So, hang okay. on, see if you. I'm, I'm waiting breathlessly. Okay. <laughs> this does not mean that we will somehow, in our own strength, be perfect. There's plenty of evidence. For example, Romans 3:19 to 24 to say that we're all sinful. You remember Romans 3:23. All of us are sinners and are hopelessly lost apart from the salvation offered by faith in Jesus Christ. We are saved by what God is able to do in us and through us if we cooperate with Him. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Okay, we need to be refined, cleansed from all earthliness till we reflect the image of our Savior and become partakers of the divine nature. When the conflict of life is ended, when the armor is laid off at the feet of Jesus, when the saints of God are glorified, then and only then will it be safe to claim that we are saved and sinless. This is Ellen G. White, Selected Messages, Book 3, page 355 and 2 to 356. Okay. In other words, what? Well... Paul describes those people in these terms. For it is by God's grace, this is Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, for it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift so that no one can boast about it. God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. It looks, we, like, it looks like the perfection, is, the perfection is the union in Christ. Yes. But it's not necessarily looking perfect, acting perfect. Um, it means allowing ourselves to be reflectors of Jesus Christ. 
We're not the sun. We well, are just so reflecting. if we don't reflect it, we're not perfect then. That's right. So you're, you're, when you're connected, you're not really connected until you're reflecting perfectly. Well, you don't have to be a perfect reflector. No, there are no perfect reflectors in our world. But you don't have to reflect something perfect to be a pretty well, good reflector. Well, it says that these people are perfect, so it couldn't yeah. be the reflecting, because you, you just said the reflection couldn't be perfect. Well, let's move on. Clearly, we can <laughs> see that at the time just before the second coming of Christ, Satan will do everything possible to deceive and possible to possibly destroy God's faithful people. But God also promises them that he will protect them and preserve them despite these tribulations if they will remain close to him. Well, since the early days of Seventh-day Adventism, questions have been raised about who these 144,000 are. And those of you who maybe grew up in the church, you must have heard this be discussed ad nauseum. Well, that question has been hotly debated. One of the best descriptions of the 144,000 is found in Great Controversy 648, paragraph 3. Um, We'll see. If we have enough time toward the end, I'll read that for you. Psalm 91, 7 to 16 is a good, good kind of summary of what we can expect. A thousand may fall dead beside you and ten thousand all around you, but you will not be harmed. You will look and see how the wicked are punished. Whenever I read that passage, I think of a friend of mine that I got to know quite well back in college. This is a young lady who... Uh, whose parents were missionaries to China. And they were missionaries in China before the communists came in. And so they were in the last wave of people to come out right ahead of the communist army as it came like this, and they finally had to escape over to the island of Taiwan. One night, they were, they were staying in a house. Someone says, you, you know, here's a place, here's, a, here's an available spot, you can stay here overnight. They stared, stayed there overnight, they could hear bombs going off and stuff all around them and so forth. Later on, they heard that thousands of people had been killed around them. And when they got up in the morning, when they could see light, they realized that someone had already, in the back half of the house where they were staying, it was full of ammunition. If someone hit that whole house, yes. they would have just been gone. I, so that's what I think of every time I read this mm. verse. I see that it reminds me of the atom bombs on Japan. Yeah. You have made the Lord your defender, the Most High your protector, and so no disaster will strike you. No violence will come near your home. God will put his angels in charge of you to protect you wherever you go. They will hold your hand, hold you up with their hands to keep you from hurting your feet on the stones. Okay. If I can get my cursor to go here. Okay. So, these are precious promises. God will care for those who are his faithful people. So will God allow any of his faithful people to be killed after the close of probation? No. no Not a single one. No point to it. But there are some things which we might wish we knew, but we don't. God chooses to keep some things secret. Jim, I think you've got some words about Deuter that. Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, there are some things that the Lord our God has kept secret but he has revealed his law, and we and our descendants are to obey it forever from the Good News Bible. Christ says that there will be those in the church who will present fables and suppositions when God has given grand, elevating, ennobling truths which should ever be kept in the treasure house of the mind. Isn't that a wonderful word, yes. Smithing? Yes. Kept in the treasure house of the mind. When men pick up this theory and that theory, when they are curious to know something it is not necessary for them to know, God is not leading them. It is not his plan that his people shall present something which they have to suppose, which is not taught in the word. It is not his will that they shall get into controversy over questions which will not help them spiritually, such as, who is to compose the 144,000? This, those who are the elect of God, will in a short time know without question. In other words, we're not supposed to worry about that now. Not supposed to worry about that now. That's an interesting quote. It's, that comes from Selected Messages, Book 1, 174. Yes. It's interesting, if you look at that, 
That was in Ellen White's Notebook Leaflets, Volume 2, page 164. How many of you have read the Notebook Leaflets? Selected messages, but three printed there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It might have been a draft, though. If you well, start taking all these all the, these little notes here and there, this is. Yeah, I mean, she goes. She may go through and edit them later. Yes. But um, it's interesting that she would sometimes. She would say, "Okay, this is not something I don't have the full picture right now." And so she would just open this little notebook that she kept by her desk. She'd be writing at three o'clock in the morning. These are her notebook leaflets, and and later pieces of that. Fortunately, were preserved and used in books and other things like that. Have you seen any of those leaflets? I've got some. I, I, they're available. I mean, I've read them. I have. No, I'm talking about uh, the originals. A photocopy of her handwriting and everything. I've seen yeah. a few. Yeah. And yeah. they're not, they're not, perfect, at all. There's some misspellings and everything. You, you know, let, let me ask you a question. If I woke you up at three o'clock in the morning and asked you to write something down, how perfect would it be? She does pretty good for her education. <laughs> well, and considering this her age, written, this wasn't written in the nighttime. This is written while she was on the train or something. Well, these lots of different notes written at different times and notes. Well, that's what I'm saying. That that there are notes that she edited, and and her yeah. secretaries helped her edit it. Yeah. That's true. And, um, so, and so I I'm not so sure. You know, when you start going through all her notes that she didn't really intend to publish, and then and then publish them if they're going to be right on or not. In every little point you're talking in every, about. Yeah, in every yeah. little point. So well, I think it's pretty good advice to say, let's not worry about the 144,000. It's a rather complex theory. Yeah, but I'm <laughs> a little bit out. uncomfortable with saying that you can't even be curious about it. OK, well, yeah, you should be curious. Dennis, I think you've got a word well, about it's, that. It's, uh, it is Ellen White in the Review and Herald March 9. To, uh, 1905, let us strive with all the power that God has given us to be among the 144,000. Wow. Okay, so are we supposed to not really care about the 144,000? A couple of different things that are almost diametrically opposed. Well, how can you, how can you yeah, strive for it unless you know something yeah. about them? Yeah, and well, if you don't here, know something like about, about it because about it. she says not to worry about it, well then, um, where do you go from there? Okay, so how do we put those two points together? That's one of the things we have to do from this lesson. Yeah, well, if the 144,000 are the ones that are going to be alive when Jesus comes, how can we, I mean, how can she say in her time, let us strive to be mm -hmm. among mm -hmm. the 144,000 when she's long dead? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just... Um, well, well and, and, and I will tell you that... Uh, the, the, she's going to say at some point she says he, uh, God said to her you with the 144,000 oh. and I can tell you that it also says that in another place that um, or implies let me just not to say it very precisely implies that those who die as faithful members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church after 1844 might be raised in that special resurrection be a part of the 144,000. That's a possibility. That's how they would be alive to see yeah. them come. Yeah. There was one that vision. Yeah. There was Take one vision in early writings, and I forget which one it is. She comes to a point and she says, the 144,000 triumph. Mm -hmm. Triumph over what? It, and then it goes on, but it doesn't explain that. So mm -hmm. maybe that's the point where they triumph over the grave. Mm -hmm. We know that one of the important characteristics of the 144,000 is that they will be able to sing a new song, which no one else can sing because they have been through an experience like no other group in history ever has. Well, in our study for this week, we have talked about seals and sealing, the cosmic conflict and the work of the Holy Spirit and the sealing. And we have just discussed the 144,000, whether it is literal or symbolic or whether it is the same as that great multitude that were seen before the throne of God. In ancient times, sealing accomplished two main purposes. One, it validated the contents as being authentic or official because of the nature of the seal. And two, it prevented others from viewing the contents of the scroll who are not authorized to open the seal because there's no way you could look at what's in the scroll without breaking the seal. We've also seen that sealing is a mark of ownership. 
Um, and I can tell you what happened. Um, there are many, many little uh, bully. They're called bully. They're little things about this big around lumps of clay so that if you had a, a jar of wine or a cask full of wheat or something like that and you closed it up, you would wrap it tight with a string and then you would take the two ends of the string, you would put it under a, uh, under in a, in m m mix it in, a, in right in a lump of clay, and then you put your stamp on that lump of clay, and then you let it dry. And the reason that's important and, and interesting to us is that many of those, the, the string and the, and the bags and so forth, have long since disappeared over the hundreds of years. <clears throat> but many places where those Things, things were stored were burnt with fire in the case, as a result of a war or something like that. And guess what happens to clay when you burn it with fire? Hardens. It, hard. it becomes very hard. And so, yep. And so now they're finding lots of these little bully, and there's more than a hundred people that are mentioned in the Bible. We now have their names mm. on bully. Very interesting. You think they're actually the people? Or, yeah. or just the names? No, no. Because everybody had the same well, names. It, but, well, and there are a few places. There's some of them where you couldn't be absolutely sure it's that person. But it'll say, Josiah, son of Jehoshaphat. And the Bible talks about how Josiah is the son of Jehoshaphat. Well, that's, and we know, we know when it happened. We know when that place was burned. And so if you get the date, or pretty close to the date, and you got the right name, and the f name of the father, that's pretty compelling evidence that you're, you're talking about the same person. So it did have all that information. Yeah. On, not just the name. Not just the name. No, it's archaeology. Yeah. You can read about it in the uh, biblical archaeology. Biblical archaeology They're review. They're always showing you pictures and stuff of mm. that kind of stuff. Mm. So those bully showed who, who, if you see this lump of clay and there's a stamp on it, that tells, us, tells you who, who that bag of stuff or that bottle of stuff belongs to. Well, everyone living on earth will have to choose, either intentionally or by default, which side he will be on. Is he going to be on God's side or the devil's side? Read Ephesians 4, 27. Let me do that very quickly. Don't give the devil a chance. In, ver in verse 5, verse 1, since you are God's dear children, you must try to be like him. So those are the two sides. We must do everything we can to remain faithful to God and to avoid giving the devil any kind of chance. So what about these two different groups, 144,000 and the great multitude? Well, if you have a chance to read Revelation 5, 5 and 6, we've already read that, but you can go back and read chapter 1, verses 10 to 12 and 17, 1 to 3. These verses could suggest that the 144,000 are the same as the great multitude. Some have suggested that. However, there is good evidence to suggest that the 144,000 represent those who are translated at the end of this earth's history without seeing death, while the great multitude include all those who have been saved from all time periods and are standing before God's throne in heaven. So I think that's probably the best. Look at Revelation 14, 1 to 5. So what do you see happening in our world today? Does it seem like God's angels are holding back the winds of strife? Or are they letting go? They certainly have been time. There certainly have been times when things seemed even worse than they are right now. For example, in the middle of World War II or the Holocaust. But still, things are pretty bad. Clearly, the devil is responsible for all the evil which is happening. Well, and you know, somewhere in the earth, the end times are happening right now. Yep. Desperate things. Mm-hmm. Yep. When you look at the news and read and listen to NPR, you, I'm just shocked at the things that are taking place in certain places that the local stuff that we watch, the media, doesn't really cover. Yeah. Because the, the world's desperate in places. It's the end of time is right around us. Let me read a passage from Revelation 12 that might give us something to think about. Have you forgotten the encouraging words which God speaks to you as his sons and daughters? These are his words, My children, pay attention when the Lord corrects you. Do not be discouraged when he rebukes you, because the Lord corrects everyone he loves and punishes everyone he accepts as his child. So that's what parents are supposed to do, right? Discipline their children. Well, we know that we will spend eternity in a beautiful place where there will be no trials, no problems, no death, 
no torture, no tribulations, or anything of that sort. So why do we need to go through these terrible events just before Jesus comes? Again, Satan must be giving a, given an opportunity to prove what things would be like if he were allowed to be in charge. But more than that, God will use these trials to discipline and prepare his children for their eternal life. God is not the cause of all the troubles that will be coming on this earth, but he allows them to enhance the Christ-likeness of his followers. This will prepare them to fulfill a unique role in eternity. See Revelation 7, verses 7, 14 to 15. Wouldn't you like to be a part of that group? Now let me just read you about that group. This is uh, Great Controversy, page 648, paragraph 3. Upon the crystal sea before the throne, that sea of glass, as it were, mingled with fire, so resplendent is it with the glory of God, are gathered the company that has gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. With the Lamb upon Mount Zion, having the harps of God, they stand the hundred and forty-four thousand that were redeemed from among men, and there is heard as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of great thunder, the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sing a new song before the throne, a song which no man can learn save the 144,000. It is a song of Moses and the Lamb, a song of deliverance. None but the 144,000 can learn that song, for it is a song of their experience, an experience such as no other company have ever had. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These, having been translated from the earth from among the living, are counted as the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. These are they which came out of great tribulation. They have passed through the time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. They have endured the anguish of the time of Jacob's trouble. They have stood without an intercessor through the final outpouring of God's judgments, but they have been delivered, for they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before God. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They have seen the earth wasted with famine and pestilence, the sun having power to scorch men with great heat, and they themselves have endured suffering, hunger and thirst. But they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any high heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Wow. So there, if you want to know who the 144,000 are, it's hard to get a more precise, detailed description than what we read right there. Our loving Father, as we look through these passages and we have discovered, even among ourselves here, that there can be different understandings of these things, help us to understand them the way you want us to understand them, to understand the marvelous plans you have for us in the future. May those days come soon, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.